Um, so thanks for having me here. This is great. I actually last week moved to Google DeepMind, um, which is a uh, group in London. So I'm a little jet lag, but um, hopefully I can still uh, make some sense out of what I'm saying. Also, um, I must say that some of the talk is going to be a little redundant with what Andre presented, but that's great because then I can just use what uh, he taught you guys and uh, be a little faster, maybe. Um, but I, I wanted to basically try to convey the excitement on the research that's been going on uh, with sequences and mapping from sequences to sequences um, in the last year, year and a half or so. And um, first and foremost, uh, I, I would like to point out that a lot of the work I'm presenting here is uh, through great collaboration, so, so it's very important to collaborate um, as you do research and, and work and so on, so, so big kudos to a lot of people that are there and not there. Um, and as we probably are here gathered for, for a reason, but I actually started in, in deep learning before it was cool. Um, but, but nowadays, actually, we can see somewhat of an exponential growth on both deep learning, uh, according to Google, model of the world um, in, in terms of volumes of search. And also, like, uh, and we can see that kind of machine learning and deep learning are kind of correlated and other cool things that happened in the past, like SBMs are kind of out of uh, shape, maybe. Um, uh, but that, that also tells us a little bit that things might come back and you know, neural nets also were not as cool as they are now in the past. And um, I would say also that, uh, I mean, needless to say, uh, neural nets are very efficient at mapping uh, all sorts of like images or signals um, to classify classification <coughs> outputs or, or, or whatnot. And these, they have become so good that actually, um, so we are seeing sort of these uh, models that classify onto classes are already like being used and useful for us. Uh, when we want to retrieve some memories and we cannot be possibly bothered to label all the images we've ever taken, uh, like C images or even videos. Um, so that's, I'm not going to talk about this, but that's sort of uh, already like showing that, you know, uh, lots of startups and so on are productionizing uh, lots of the technology that um, advanced uh, state-of-the-art models in computer vision, speech recognition, and language modeling. Talking of which, um, one of my passions, because I have a speech recognition background, is recurrent, uh, recurrent neural networks, recurrency, and sequences. And so to kind of recap what Andre said, but actually, um, instead of characters, we're going to think about words here. Um, and this is sort of a task where uh, there is actually a large amount of data. So Google released a data set about two years ago that had one billion words, um, and these are just typical sentences you would find uh, in newspapers and, and so on. And for a while, uh, it was uh, thought that you know, n-grams or counts would be, uh, uh, were very good models at modeling language. Um, but if you train your network to play, to play this game of what is the next word going to be, um, given all that I observed in the past, it turns out that with recent advances mostly, they actually do a very good job at being less perplexed, meaning being better at predicting um, the words that they see in, in, a, you know, a, in a testing data set. So these are, this is some paper actually we're preparing for the upcoming ICML, but uh, we have a very uh, a good language model that puts probability distributions over sentences of English. And uh, again, as a human, you could play this game, and you probably would be much better than these 30 there, but hopefully we're going to close the gap. And a way to see that we're not so great yet at modeling language, even despite the efforts and advances on these sort of models, can be seen from sampling the model. So we can ask the model to produce, again, a program, or in this case, uh, a sentence. And you would see that these are pseudo believable to be written by a human, except they're off, uh, often times. So, for example, the last sentence, it's sort of okay, but it says some of the obese people lived five to eight years longer than others, which probably is not the case if we believe that obesity is a, a bad thing to, to be. Um, nonetheless, these models are state of the art right now, and it's sort of um, it was the, the models and, and, and sort of the data sets were like, studied for a very long time. Um, but what's sort of, let's see, it's not working very well. Okay. 
Um, and these I'm really explained, so I kind of skip, but these, these boxes are small neural networks that take history of what they've seen in the past and the current world, and they try to predict the next work optimally. And one important note why things are becoming easier over time is the fact that this thing called LSTM, which everyone is talking about, which is crucial in some cases to make these models learn, have a very sort of complicated set of equations that I, I wrote there to the left. But it so happens that good libraries that uh, the open source community uh, and, and the universities are putting out have made implementing all sorts of these equations fairly straightforward. So Fiano, uh, TensorFlow, and, and, and you know, Torch, and so on are, are great examples on you just have an idea, you write equations, and you write single lines of Python code that almost one to one map to the equations, and then you can optimize and learn models based on your new idea that might become the next big thing or the next big recurrent neural net. Um, and I, in 2011, when I started working on recurrent neural nets, I knew about this model, but it was just unbelievably hard to code all the derivatives, so I just gave up and I stick to the you know, classic RNN, which was also a pain to, to code, but it was less painful than this model that has more matrices and parameters and so on. So, um, that being said, uh, there is, um, besides the common language modeling that I, that I described, there is there was a very simple idea that we proposed a couple of years ago at NIMS, um, Ilio, Clock, and I. And it seems almost straightforward in retrospect, but this was sort of surprising to many that something like this would work. And it's the following. Instead of just playing the game of predicting the next word, given what, what you've predicted so far, can you condition these predictions on some other information that you might want to read? So machine translation is the obvious example, and you can read some words in English, have them sort of in your memory, and then say, now I'm gonna spit them out in French. And a very simple model, trained end to end, turned out to be very good at translating um, sentences, which happens to be a very uh, hard problem in NLP. So this kind of convinced a large uh, part of the community that we could now perhaps map sequences that we would read into some memory of an LSTM, ABCD, and to optimally to the output, the desired output um, that we want to, to output at, 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 for that given sentence pair or input rather. And so this enabled a lot of research uh, on what's now being called like sequence to sequence modeling, where the input is not, no longer an image, but it's sort of uh, an interesting sequence of observations perhaps, or perhaps a single image like in capturing and so on. And here are some examples, most of which, as you will see, are dated last year because this is a fairly recent uh, kind of reinvigoration of, of recurrent neural nets research. Um, and I'm, so to recap, what you actually achieve is you get a sentence, you memorize it into a vector, and then from that you can optimally sort of translate to a different language or, or do all sorts of things, uh, creative things like Andrew also was showing before. Um, and this result is uh, from Stanford, and Chris actually talked, uh, mentioned this before, but um, many, many systems that are very good at translating are starting to incorporate these ideas as core elements of uh, the training procedure to produce a state-of-the-art translation. Um, so that's great, and the, the community has been great at that sort of pushing this idea forward. Um, one obvious thing that actually the, the, the back story here is I was, uh, Sami Benjio, who, who, who is at Google Brain as well, sent an email to me and say, hey, what, can we do translation or can we do captioning as if it was a translation task? And before going home, I literally changed two lines in my code because it literally is, instead of reading French, I'm going to give you this vector as Andre explained, so I'm not going to repeat myself. And it turns out that this, you can do this, and, and many other groups found that this out, and we published this last year at CVPR uh, 2015. And the cool thing about this model is that it's again trained end to end. I don't know exactly how what it's doing uh, precisely, but the weights are such that you produce sort of the optimal caption. Um, and more important, there was a, a, a core a set, a, a set of people that participated in a competition, which basically enabled the researchers to test their abilities on what is very important in deep learning, which is you have to not only think about the model and have a data set, but tune your model, tweak the hyperparameters, and so on. So many of these models here are essentially this idea of mapping from sequences to sequences with some sort of RNN, 
but the results are different, in my opinion, mostly just by experience of tweaking and regularizing the model and so on. And this is very important in deep learning, and it has to be said that it is, if you're a practitioner, you must sort of suffer this, like deciding how many layers, learning rates, optimization methods, and so on. And it is so important that uh, the model really <coughs> boosts its performance just by doing this. Um, also, note, note, a note of caution is that even though we are very good in automatic metrics with respect to humans, humans are much better at being humans than our algorithms were. Um, these are the two right columns there. This point six is sort of a Turing test like uh, thing that the Microsoft Cocoa Life did. Um, so it's not a solved problem, um, but nonetheless it worked quite well. And as I was saying, here I'm showing um, sort of an image and the bottom is what the model did uh, when I submitted the paper at CVPR, which was a very good model, but then all these tweaks made not only the numbers go up, but actually made the images be quite more accurate at describing the, 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 the images that you see here. And this is not picked, these are like the first few uh, images of the validation set. Um, so really, it is very important when you have a deep learning model to sort of, as Ian was saying, believe in it that it will work and work hard to optimize it and understand what's going on and so on. Um, so this, this is old news um, and something else we tried also was to build a, a sort of a chatbot and actually the back, the, the back story here is back in 2014 when we were doing the translation work, we have this internal chat system at Google where if you have a problem you can chat with someone. So I took that data and I trained a small LSTM to produce answers. So, I posted this internally at Google uh, initially, and uh, it, it really like I basically chatted as if I had was having some problems, and the LSTM sort of believably was replying in in some sort of that nice way that you could believe. Oh, there's someone trying to tell me. Of course, if it turns out that the next day I had a real problem and I had to chat with a real person, and uh, that was kind of ironic, but. Um, Nonetheless, it looked good enough that they, uh, Greg and Anjali and then the Gmail team, um, decided, so, so to speak, to, to try to um, launch this for, for, the, for some of our users that, that are playing with these models right now um, to be use, useful. So, um, also we, we, we published a paper on this uh, where we also trained it on subtitles of movies. Very large corpus, that's always uh, kind of important to get a very good um, sort of replies that reflect um, some sort of thing that all from the world, like, like you see here. Um, the left is actually the training set. And one of the cool things is that I have no idea on building rules to build a chatbot, but just by training a model, it sort of did something that, that, that actually turned out to be a little better when we did uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk Test and other things like Cleverbot and other hand-designed um, bots out there. And as I was saying, the cool thing is that we managed to um, put this as a product where if you have an, an incoming email and there's a small neural network that decides whether it should reply or not, it will sort of, um, with the same model, so that was spanned by, from, the, from sort of this research idea of mapping from sequences to sequence, it would um, sort of reply uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of optimal way that you can, don't have to type and so on. So this is still very early days, but hopefully we can help people as well um, as doing uh, good research, right? So that's, that's a pretty, that was a pretty nice example for me on how research can get into real systems as well. And lastly, I wanted to kind of show you a little bit of other flavors um, of, of things that we've been doing. So we were talking about learning to program. So one of the ideas that we had last year and we presented at NIMS just a few months ago, actually one month ago or so, was can I give an algorithm or a neural network examples of literally points, like 2D coordinates, and that would be the input that the model takes. And all I wanted to learn is, for example, how to compute the shortest path that goes through all the points, right? So this is called traveling self-node problem, it's an NP hard problem, so it's very hard for me if I had to code this up in C++ to actually come up with an algorithm that would be not super naive and inefficient. But what happened is I just collected a bunch of data, so I took examples of points and what was the sequence of instructions to go through the, through the points optimally, and then I trained almost the same model as the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model that you've seen on this data, and then it turned out that it did fairly reasonable. In most cases it succeeded, and when it didn't, 
Um, it's almost imperceptible. There's a small difference there. Um, it's an error or a mistake that the network does, but it actually, without me knowing anything about NP hard or problem assessment problem, just by having data, it learned, so to, so to speak, to, to, to generate an optimal path. So that was quite surprising, I would say. And it's a trend that we're seeing to add memories and sort of learning algorithms with neural networks. Um, so this is a fairly uh, active area of research right now, and I believe also in the morning you saw a talk by Ilya as well. Something as we've been trying, for example, is to better um, model sentences in the context of vectors. So, so word to vec or blob are great models that are mo at modeling words, but to model full sentences, naively speaking, you can do that with a sequence-to-sequence -sequence autoencoder, but if you try to, for example, have a sentence, an origin sentence, and a, and a destination sentence, and interpolate between them, the things be that you see between are not great. Um, these are not, almost nonsensical, and it's trying to some somewhat interpolate between the first sentence and the last. And a paper that we put on a few months ago with, with our interns, Sam and, and Luke, actually managed to find a much better representation of sentences that more gracefully interpolates two sentences. So it sort of removes quotes and, you know, I want to talk to you, I want to be with you, I don't want to be with you, I don't want to be with you without quotes, and she didn't want to be with him. So at least it's a little better in, and it's more believable that these vectors that represent sentences might be useful for other things. Um, however, we did not find yet a use case other than, for example, filling blanks and so on. And lastly, um, speech recognition is, uh, is what I started uh, when I started deep learning. So there's been a bunch of research on taking the same sequence to sequence idea where you literally read the audio in and then you speak one character at a time out. And we are closing the gap um, slowly but surely with the sort of the production system that runs on every Android phone uh, that does speech recognition. So this is fairly exciting departure from classical models like hidden Markov models and so on. Um, so to conclude, I think in the past two years we've seen sequences become first-class citizens um, beyond uh, images or, or like speech recognition as it was classically done. And uh, with enough data, definitely sequence to sequence can map very complicated, can learn very complicated functions to map from to. And new things like attention mechanisms and memories that we've seen also in the last year or so are going to be great for us to be able to perhaps attempt to learn algorithms, learn from sets of data or other kinds of data structures that are not necessarily sequences. And I hope to see sort of discrete actions and maybe different kinds of losses other than optimizing what comes next. So I expect this to be like one of the big things to come in the few years to come. And actually, we've seen some work on that already um, in the next round of papers for the next conference. And thanks a lot. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you.